Yeah, thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Usually in sustainability settings, you often get the physics first and the biology and so on, and then the social aspects and human aspects are added to the end. And we, we really wanted to do it the other way around, which I'm happy we did. So um, uh, I will go a little bit to the f fundamentals of Earth system science, if you will, and give a very brief introduction into that. But I found this morning on social media, I found this slide stolen from somebody's uh, talk somewhere with the camera. Um, <clears throat> I don't know who stole it and <laughs> where, but at least the, the original author is on it. And I felt myself really very much at home in this, in this citation that uh, uh, I used to, link, to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And I thought that with 30 years of, of good science and communication also, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. And once that's one take home message from my talk. I also don't know how to do that. I'm here to come, uh, I come here to, to, to learn about that. So um, the topics that are going through my mind when I look at the physical and biological capacity of the Earth system are planetary boundaries uh, that Natalie has just introduced, uh, also issues of the runaway greenhouse, um, maybe methane class rates will uh, cause problems. I don't go into those. There will be tipping points. Uh, we're actually often feeling rather lost in this, in this world, and we're feeling that we're heading towards collapse, collapse and there's not going to be much collapsology in my, in my talk, but it's, uh, I'm increasingly realizing that if we don't talk about uh, the potential of collapse, then we're missing out some essential aspects of, of reality, and we, so we have to consider that as well. And of course, on the human and social side, there's the economics, there's migration, there's war, uh, very much so these days, there's hunger, there's resource conflicts. And I'm not going to talk about all of that, but I'll give you a little bit the status today for the physical and biological side of things. And to be really um, up to date, I took a picture from a friend of mine, Stefan Ramsdorf, uh, just a few days old, this picture, and it shows the incredible acceleration of global warming that we're living exactly these days. Last September was one, uh, 0.45 degrees warmer than any other September ever since measurements are being made on the, on the planet. And not only is that a very big jump, but it also means strictly some form of ac acceleration. I mean, not just that September, but we are absolutely not in a mode where we are reducing the degree of warming that we, we know of. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the warming that we, we go through is unprecedented for the last uh, 2,000 years. We lived uh, during the warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. And uh, this is all observations. This is not modeling. This is not, uh, uh, not uh, some kind of assumptions about the future. And I like this diagram very much, and it's, it's one of the slides that uh, Natalie jumped over in her, in her collection, because what it really shows, it shows the difference bit, uh, f from two uh, sets of climate model simulations, one uh, that basically simulates the Earth system as we know it today with the increasing greenhouse gases, and the black line is the actual temperature that is observed. And if we don't, if we run the same model without any uh, additional, uh, without any human emissions in it, we will get this flat curve. In other words, we get some variability. We see Mount Pinatubo when it exploded. We see all those things. But we can uh, actually understand how, not, it's not just the correlation, but we can understand how greenhouse gases affect the climate system. And we, of course, also know where they come from and which ones they are. Uh, it's not just CO2. It's also methane. It's, it's nitrous oxide. And, uh, if we take them all together, then we can, uh, can actually see where they come from. Most of it is fossil fuel burning, of course, uh, but some part of it is cement production and flaring in gas fields. And there's this yellow-orange part down here, which looks small in this graph, but it's actually several gigatons per year, and it's human land use. So it's, uh, it means that we are not just, uh, not just burning fossil fuels, we are actually burning the biosphere, too, so even the living biosphere. Uh, we are basically uh, putting it into the atmosphere and the ocean. And we know the consequences. It's also observed. And we, we should uh, remember them. I mean, I, this, is, uh, this may all so sound like old hats to you, but I think we have to face the numbers. Um, we have to realize that species are being lost. At, they're always 
there always have been species lost in the, in the Earth system, but now at, a, at an accelerating rate. Um, we have in, in, in freshwater species, for example, about 35% of species that are, that are threatened or extinct since uh, 1500, M way, way uh, more than we would have in a, in a normal, non-human non world, if you will. And we have enough knowledge now and enough observations and reconstructions to, uh, to make those same inferences about all kinds of uh, groups of species on the planet. So we, have, we live deep in a biodiversity crisis and what's worse about the, what's different from the biodiversity crisis and the, uh, from the climate crisis is that we don't see it as much as we, we now begin as well. I mean, I, uh, I often take this example when I was a, uh, where as a kid and we were driving in the car somewhere, we had to clean the windscreen every now and then. You don't do that today anymore. And there are people who have actually figured out that this is not due, due to the better aerodynamics of the cars. It's just because there are actually less insects in the, in the area, in, 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 a, in our ecosystem. And, and that's, uh, uh, you may not think of that as a drama when it comes to your car, but of course it's a, it's a dramatic decl decline. And for uh, both by the, uh, species and for also for ecosystems, we know the drivers. We know it's not just climate change. We know it's a, it's a crisis that, that's brought about by direct and indirect drivers of change. Uh, land use and sea use change being the main culprit, um, but also direct exploitation of the biosphere, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species. And by the way, this is uh, for the source, maybe not something you are so extremely familiar with. There's, you do all know about the IPCC, but there is a panel, a global panel for biodiversity, which is called the Intergovernmental Platform Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, IV, IPBS, and this is from their, uh, from, from their global assessment. <clears throat> and the IPCC has, has done, contrary to what many people believe, a lot of work on, on, uh, on uh, changes in, in ecosystems as well. And I'm only showing this diagram to tell you that the IPCC has now become some sort of an encyclopedia. You can actually zoom into any kind of chapter uh, and you find these tables and the, behind the tables there are lots of references and you basically find the sources about how ecosystems are changing, how species ranges are changing, how they are related to climate or not. And, and so the knowledge is there, the observations are there. And uh, in a way, the one extreme way of showing the amount of knowledge that we have about the crisis is this uh, study which has, uh, by a machine learning algorithm, analyzed 77,000 pa scientific papers in the literature, uh, trying to find uh, indications, regionalized, geographically localized in indications of uh, impacts of climate change, and uh, has produced this map, which shows very much differently from what we had seven or eight years ago, which shows that that not only do we have impacts of climate change everywhere in the world, but we also know about them. Before, we probably had them as well over everywhere in the world, but we didn't know. But the, the amount of monitoring and scientific assessment that takes place in countries of the global south has, has incredibly ca caught up uh, with, uh, with the knowledge that we had a few years ago. So we can now say there is no single place on this planet where you do not see the impacts of climate change. And there are, of course, ways to look at it like in this way, which uh, is, is just an example from Spain last year. Um, this is anthropogenic climate change because, uh, of course, people say, yes, there have always been wildfires in the Mediterranean. But these uh, strong events, <coughs> uh, very uh, close to, to where people live, are significantly strengthened by, by, the, by the amount of warming we've had. And I've had a little bit hesitation if I should sh show this picture, but I think we do need to think about uh, the disaster only a few weeks ago in Libya, uh, because it tells us several things. It tells us, first of all, that uh, the global south has less resources to protect itself against the impacts of climate change. The second, the, and which I think is really terrible about this one, we will never even know how many people have lost their lives in this disaster, but we know it's more than six or 7,000. So it's, it's huge. And the third thing, and it's, it was already the case before the, uh, the war between Israel and uh, Hamas, um, already before, we had already forgotten about it. It was already gone from the, from the international media. 
So we live in the crisis of, of climate and, and biodiversity loss and habitability, uh, which is a term which we will come back to uh, throughout this week, is clearly declining and clearly at risk. Now, when it comes to projections, we also have a very, we are in a very strong position through the work of, of scientists from, from many different disciplines. And we can, for example, make this relatively straightforward linear statement that the IPCC does in its summaries. We can say that with every increment of global warming, there will be regional changes in climate and, the, and also the extremes that will become more widespread and more pronounced. So the hottest day temperature change, we can map this, what it means for the, for the future. Some people say, well, but there's so much uncertainty in there. There is still un some uncertainty, which is also communicated by the IPCC. But most of the uncertainty is, of course, about our climate policies. We do not actually know whether someday uh, governments will actually become serious about uh, the, the, the need to, to uh, reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Only then will the uncertainty will in that, that part will, will be reduced. And I'm only skipping these uh, quickly here to show what, what is possible now in terms of physical knowledge about the future on the planet and uh, thereby the physical and biological aspects of habitability. Uh, we know what the wettest day precipitation changes will be, not with this projector, but you can see it on my, on my screen. And you can also see how the biological consequences of these changes in the future will evolve and that they are directly related to the amount of warming that we allow the system to, to undergo. Um, and there's human health estimates and estimates for food production and related quantities. <coughs> so this is kind of a linear scaling, if you will. Um, we have the models, we have scenarios that are basically monotonously looking forward into a linearly a linear increase of of greenhouse gases maybe leveling off a little bit or not leveling off, but, but it's, it's, it's a linear picture and we can translate that in the, into a, a number of, of useful quantities. For example, here in the, in the cities of, of the Eastern Mediterranean, or the Eastern Mediterranean and, and uh, Near East um, uh, cities, we can see that by the end of the century, it's very likely that the coldest month in any summer will be warmer than the hottest month that we, uh, that, uh, that we had in the period between 1961 and 1990. So we go into a completely different regime and it's going to cost more lives than we have already seen disappear. But the concept that we need to uh, introduce on top of this linear view is the one of tipping points because um, that is uh, uh, something that I would have liked to have much more time to, to explain and go into the details of, but there is, um, uh, there's not much time. Uh, there's also a lot of confusion and, and uh, perhaps poor understanding of the tipping point. So the theoretically, this map shows, a, this uh, chart shows a map of the world, but you can, uh, can almost guess it. It says Greenland here, it says Arctic there, and, East, and Antarctic there in the south. So we know that different parts of the system of the planet have the physical capacity to flip into a different mode. Uh, whether that's irreversible or not irreversible remains to be seen, but it will be a, a, these will be sh um, short and nonlinear changes in, this, in the physical uh, conditions of the system. And they will be disastrous at a much, much, much higher level, most of them than the linear trends that I've been uh, showing you. We do not have IPCC type maps of, this, of the consequences of these because, for, for several reasons, because uh, our models are currently not good enough to actually physically describe what a world with a collapsed North Atlantic thermoaline circulation, for example, will look like. And, uh, and, and also we do not really know when it is going to happen. But what this analysis shows is that for many of the, of the known tipping elements in the, in the Earth system, there is now reasonably good estimates at, at the temperature level where they might become uh, a, a reality. And there are a, a number of them, which are the red ones, the Greenland ice sheet loss, uh, the Western Arctic ice sheet loss, and uh, the, the, uh, which used to be called the Gulf Stream Collapse, but now has a different name, they are actually likely to happen during the next few decades because we are on, a track, on track to, to uh, two degrees uh, warming. 
And um, that's not all of them, what, uh, all of what we need to know about them, but there's also a study from Tim Lent and others that shows that they're actually cascading, they're actually triggering each other. They're actually in a situation where if you have, for example, a large loss, uh, if you have a, a large change in, in the Atlantic circulation here, then that also has negative impacts on the West Antarctic ice sheet because it will make, uh, produce warmer water conditions around, the, around Antarctica and thereby potentially enhance the, the process that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Um, and there are other connections like these. Some of them may, you may see as speculative because the physical Earth system models cannot fully describe them, but there's enough evidence to, uh, to suspect that they are uh, acting. And certainly, like with any uncertainty, in, <laughs> uh, uh, with any uncertain conditions in the Earth system, the uncertainty is not your friend. So the, 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 the risks that are associated with, the, with, with these events are so high that you would rather like absolute certainty to be protected against them. And we don't have that. The, the models do not give you that anymore. The models show that there is some slight uh, probability that these, uh, that these things might happen. So this is what happens in, in Antarctica. Again, you don't, don't really quite see that. This is the, one of the famous glaciers in the Antarctica, the most dynamic one, the Thwaites Glacier, but it's not the only one uh, which, has, um, which is sitting firmly on the bedrock of, of Antarctica, but it has <clears throat> ice flowing out into the Amundsen Sea, and that ice is warming from below with the warmer uh, ocean waters that are getting in there. And this will create a more rapid departure of the icebergs from there. It's a natural process, but it will be more rapidly, and thereby creates these huge ice cliffs that are not regularly there, because normally the flow of the ice of the uh, glacier on land was in some sort of equilibrium with the production of icebergs at, of the coast. But there will be, and there perhaps already is, we don't know that for sure, now an enhanced departure of these floating ice shelves and thereby a big risk of collapse of these ice, of these uh, vertical walls of the glacier and thereby an increased flow of the glacier from the inland and basically a process which can be co uh, called Antarctic deglaciation. It will not be completely deglaciating Antarctica, but it leads to one process of big concern and that is accelerated sea level rise. We have sea level rise of about four millimeters per year uh, threatening obviously all coasts of the entire planet. <clears throat> we already have for the year 2100 a risk that a high, associated with Antarctica, a high scenario will actually take us not just to one, but maybe to two meters of sea level by the end of the current century. And we have this thing which I really try hard to communicate and I feel that it's never really going home to people, but I'll try again is that by the year 2300, we cannot rule out 15 meters of sea level rise. And people, uh, what I think is going often through people's minds is that, yeah, about 2300, that's really far away, isn't it? And, and surely we're going to come up with some technical solution. Uh, the physics are easy, no, we will not have a uh, technical solution, even with the most brutal geoengineering that you can imagine for the planet, the deglaciation will continue, there's no way to stop it. But also 2,300 is really not that far away. I mean, think about Galileo or Aristotle or someone, they're all f much further away in, in time than, the year, than our grandchildren's grandchildren or whatever they are in 2,300. So we are, we are heading into a world that, uh, that cannot be guaranteed to be without 15 meters of sea level due to anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic uh, inputs on the system. And of course, uh, places like the Nile Delta will, will uh, not exist anymore under those conditions like all other major deltas in the world. And already today, uh, the Nile Delta and any other coastal places face difficulties with uh, the irrigation water that is increasingly becoming saline. To almost conclude, um, there's a stability issue therefore with the system. And there's been the, the big question, can we somehow imagine that we can, can somehow restabilize the system which is clearly getting out of, out of um, balance there. <clears throat> and this system, this diagram also from work by Will Steffen who, who passed away earlier this year, um, a, a very important person, but really also uh, like Natalie said, I mean he's basically 
part of a group of, of thinkers and modelers in this area. This, what, what this uh, time uh, stability diagram shows us is that we are on a path towards warmer conditions, but we have actually options um, uh, and, and they can be modeled in a semi-quantitative way, if you will, where we, where we uh, either pass a planetary threshold and therefore, therefore lose, completely lose control, which is currently the path that we are on, or we can uh, potentially uh, reduce uh, the risks and, and, uh, and stabilize the Earth system. And that was basically the initial question. Can we actually do that? Are we doing the things that are required in order to bring the system back into some sort of stabilized condition? Uh, the IPCC answer to this is that we need something which is called climate resilient development. In other words, we don't just need to reduce emissions, which is obviously, uh, I mean, I don't even need to say that, but uh, we, we, do, we, we do need to consider human development and societal development in the context of climate change and biodiversity loss just as much. Uh, and there, I think there's some quite good writing in the last IPCC report on that, which I, which I uh, recommend to your reading. It's based on the idea that climate and, the, and human society and the ecosystems are in some sort of triangular or circular relationship that can be described. And we need to really three, look at all three components together if we want to address the transformations that are necessary. In the tipping points literature, there's of course the growing uh, theme that I only just blink at you here of the social tipping points, which is rather a positive story, which is rather the question, what can we do in society in order to make transformation possible? Which sectors, is it education, is it research, is it the uh, econ economy? Where can we actually change things so that, that we come on, the, on a better pathway? And so if, you, if we look for a way to stabilize the Earth system, we really need to understand those, those social tipping points. <clears throat> and then we look at what, the, what our governments do, and I think what, I, what they do at the moment are uh, these things, at least in the Mediterranean, uh, where, where I work, there's basically no serious attempt to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a major scale. I mean, there are some, there are some talks, there are some, some little, what did the, uh, the, the French minister just tell people to do? I guess we should draw down the, the thermostat on our heating a little bit. Uh, yes, when we, we all do that already because it's too expensive anyway. But these things, they are still, still government policy to, to, uh, to, to develop them. And I think if we ask the question, how can we stabilize? We have to address that government in action uh, in, a, in a major way. One way to do it is what Greenpeace has done. I really love this picture because they say, well, you are greenwashing the, the transportation sector, so, so we, we, we just do it for you. You don't even need to do that. It's a service provided by, by, by Greenpeace in, in this case. <clears throat> and others, of course, say that we have to actually uh, become much more proactive and, and, and take part in, in protest actions, for example, against the building of very large a new uh, res water reservoirs in a region that is suffering from, from uh, much reduced rainfall in, in southwestern France. What the government then says is, well, we're starting to shoot you. We, are, we will actually go at war against you, against the peaceful demonstrations, against, uh, against these, um, uh, um, uh, against these, uh, these pr um, projects, and we are going to call you eco-terrorists so that you know who you are. So this is where the discourse stands at the moment about stabilization, the, the, uh, stabilizing the Earth system. And as you can see, I'm not really in a very um, uh, optimistic mode, um, but I do want to leave you with this um, citation from Angela Davis, and thank you for your interest. Thank you.